Welcome to episode 39 of Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. My author guest is Sally Bellrose. So tell me a little bit about the reading that you're going to do for us. I'm going to read an excerpt, actually, most of chapter two from The Girls Club, Mm -hmm. which is a novel published by Bywater Books. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's uh, three teenage sisters in 1966. Yeah, Catholic girls must be dating. (laughs) (laughs) I was one of those Catholic girls. Yes, it's a theme. (laughs) Okay, all right, I'm ready. Okay. Chapter 2, The Girls Club, 1966. Every time I go to confession, there's some weird girl who forgets her scarf and has to put a hanky over her head before she's allowed in church. Today, it's me. An old lady comes out of confessional. I take her place and kneel inside. I smell Listerine and Brill Cream, Father Anton. He's nosy, a detail man. He's the one who wanted to ask me, who wanted to know if I asked the Blessed Virgin Mary for help or kept thinking about Mrs. Gilmartin's boob after I saw it flop out of her halter top. My eyes adjust to focus in the tiny, dark rooms. I listen hard. Dead silence, not even my own breathing as I wait. I touch the little accordion pleats on the shutter with my fingertips just to feel something I know is real. Whoosh! The little door slides open, the shadowy outline of the priest's face through the grill that separates us. is a side view, like Alfred Hitchcock, only skinny. My first Holy Communion was six years ago, but I still get palpitations every time. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been a week since my last confession. My sins are, I disrespected my mother 17 times. I disrespected my father four times. I took the name of the Lord in vain. By mistake, one time I had impure thoughts. I smeared the good name of others. I lied. It's better to blurt it out all in one breath. The nature of your impure thoughts, his voice is low and deep. I listened to my best friend's impure thoughts, and I thought about what I was thinking about and what I was listening to. He cuts me off. You disrespected your sister? Yes, Father. I should have said annoyed. Disrespect is too serious for my sister Marie. But this is better than going after the adored my best friend part. How? He stretches out the word. I kind of annoyed her father. What was the nature of the the annoying disrespect? He wants details. I have to spit out the story about me scratching my sister Marie's headboard and my sister Renee growling to make Marie think there's, there was something scary besides, of course, Marie in our room. I tell him about us having to sleep with our beds pushed together because there are only two bedrooms in the house. I tell him I'm the youngest. It's really good to seem as young and deprived as possible when you're talking to a priest. I wait him out with my hands folded and my elbows resting on the ledge sticking out below the shutter. My arms tremble. Finally, he says, remember, you are talking to, you are not talking to me. You are talking through me to the merciful Lord. You say you adore your best friend. How does this adoration manifest, child? Now he's talking fake reasonable, like mom, before she blows. I've had an answer ready for him ever since Sister Mary Teresa described the tingly, radiant feeling she has for the Blessed Mary and emotions, she said in her soap opera voice. One reserves for Christ, his Holy Father, and the Virgin Mother. Nuns include Mary as part of the deity you're allowed to adore. I quote Sister Mary Teresa, I feel happy, abundantly happy when I'm with her. Is that all? He asks in a throne. He uses to wrap up. Yes, Father. Wow, that's all. You can never be sure what a priest's going to react to or what he's going to let slide. For your penance, 50 Our Fathers, 50 Hail Marys, 50 Acts of Contrition. He hammers down each 50 like a gavel. He clears his throat. You will beseech the Blessed Mother to help you remain pure of thought and deed. I smell peppermint gum on the word deed. You will confess your sins against your aggrieved sister and ask for forgiveness. With the power entrusted in me by our Father in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ and his holy church, I forgive your sins. Snap, a little shutter closes. Holy shit, 150 prayers and confess to my aggrieved sister. 
Kneeling at the altar, I tick off all 150. Then, hands clasped, head bowed, I walk down the middle aisle, stick my fingers in the basin of holy water, make the sign of the cross, and bolt through the heavy wooden doors. Fresh air. My sister Renee sits on the marble steps, dignified, stomach in, chest out. What the hell took you so long, she says. Mom's lace shawl covers her shoulders. I pull the handkerchief off my head. I told Father Anton about trying to scare Marie. What? She snatches the hanky out of my hand. Marie calls us faggots. You vowed not to tell her. Her eyes flash. She's dramatic. Marie calls everybody faggots. Antoine says I have to ask her forgiveness. Renee stalks off. I follow her. She whips around. You vowed not to tell. You gotta let me out of the vow, I say. No way. A vow counts more than an order from a priest. Her hands are on her hips. She's got the ha- she got the hands on the hips ideas from our high school's production of Oklahoma. Girls like my sister Renee are corny enough. They shouldn't be allowed to see musicals. God will put you in the heart of hell. He saves for people who break vows, she says. The hottest part, where you boil in your own sweat for eternity. You don't outrake a priest, I say. I look around Renee and see Marie in the street, right in front of St. Anne's Church, scrunched down next to a beat-up station wagon, squinting in the rearview mirror, her big butt walking half the sidewalk. Renee walks up behind Marie. Get in there, she jerks her thumb at the church. Marie ignores Renee. My sisters usually ignore each other. Marie, I jump on the hood of the car and blurt, I scratch your headboard to wake you up. Renee slips behind Marie and makes a sign like she's slitting her own throat, or maybe mine. Marie slops eyeliner over green shadow. She says, shut up and get off the car, Cora Rose. You're making the mirror turn around. I hop off the hood. Confession to a grieved sister over? Marie lifts the tip of her eyeliner, making another smudge across to her lid, admires her raccoon eyes in the rearview mirror, and smirks. Did you confess that you have the hots for Father Anton, Renee? Gross. You're going to have to confess that. Renee relaxes her mouth, mouth, which was all tight and white around the edges, and feels to make sure the straps of her bra aren't showing. I'm not confessing shit. Marie smears her lips with pink lipstick. She crosses the street and stands in front of the rectory. Jerry LaRue's Buick, with a duct tape bumper, pulls up in front of her father, and she's gone. After confession, I go to see my grandmother. She lives next door. Her kitchen floor is creak, and her cupboards have no doors on them. Hi, Mime, I say. Mime la porte pour rose. Mime, bent over her stove, stirring pig's hocks in a chipped enamel pot, doesn't even look up. I close the door and ask, Mime, you ever have impure thoughts? She gives me one of her looks. She crushes a few bay leaves into the bubbling water, stirring, she says, everyone has impure thoughts. The trick is not to dwell. Let them float through your head. She waves the soup spoon across my face, in one ear, out the other. I pull up the stool. Wow, old people still have them, I say. She gives me another look that shuts me up. If I make her mad, she'll swap me with a rag hanging from the waist on her apron. I lean on the counter with my chin in my hand, stare at the white hair piled up in a hair nut on top of her head, at the stained apron and laced up boots. She plucks the bones out of the broth with metal tongs, Put them, puts them on a cutting board to cool, scrapes the meat and marrow, and spoons it all back into the pot. You ever have a best friend, Mime? Safe subject. She likes to talk about people from her past. Yes, sir, such a mom. She stops stirring for a second, and a little smile crosses her face. Marguerite or Burbo. She moves the wooden spoon around in the pot again. Then I married your Pipe, and he became my best friend, didn't he? Did you adore them? Adore them? She smashes dried bay leaves under the flat of the knife blade. It smells like Christmas. What's on your mind, child? Nothing. I pick at my cuticles. She picks up my chin, gives me a once-over. I suppose I adored your Pipe and my mother and the Blessed Virgin. Well, what about Jesus, I ask. She sighs, and Jesus. She slides the smashed bay leaves off the knife into the bubbling water with the side of her hand. 
I guess Jesus and God Almighty are the only ones we're really supposed to adore, eh? He winks. What if you die without confessing your bad thoughts? I already know her answer. I just want to hear it again. She's busy browning flour and butter in the cast iron frying pan. She pours a few drops of water in the pan. It pops and hisses. She stirs the sauce with a metal whisk until it thickens, picks up the big pan with doubled over pot holders and pours the hot mixture into the enamel pot. When she's done, she takes a step back and says, no one ever went to hell for thinking, Cora Rose. She wipes her hand on her apron. It's what we do that counts. Each of us gets so many foolish words when we're born. When they're all used up, we die. We wait in purgatory. God takes a look at how many foolish things we've done, how many good things we've done, before he decides where we end up. But God doesn't tell you how much foolishness you get, so you better watch out what you say. She pinches a little more salt into the pot. Once you're dead, it's how you handle the trials and tribulations, not what you thought about doing that counts. She whacks a head of cabbage into wedges. She adds the cabbage to the pot, puts on a lid, and lowers the flame. How about singing? Does singing count as foolishness? Ah, uh, Meme lowers the flame under the ragu and lowers herself into a chair. You remind me of him, all oh, your chatter. She's talking about my Pepe. He's dead. Meme always moves slowly, but she doesn't usually sit down while she's working in the kitchen. An old wooden comb is on the windowsill. I pick it up. The wood is shiny and darker between the teeth. It reminds me of Pepe. Sometimes, when I was little, I'd sit and watch as he unpinned her hair and brushed it with the wooden comb. Want me to comb your hair, Mime? She looks at me funny. Yes, I do, she says, like she's surprised to hear herself say so. Her fleshy arms wobble and she, as she takes the pins out. Her thin, white hair falls halfway down her back. Her scalp is pink. I hold her hair, delicate like mom's lace in my hand, and drag the comb slowly through it, trying not to break the brittle strands. Three white hairs stick in the comb and fall to the floor. Mimi leans back, closes her eyes, and says, Sing. Sing for Rose, a nice French song. Some of Pepe's old songs are really dirty. I comb and sing Frère Jacques. Mimi sings, Dormez-vous, dormez-vous. She stops singing, shakes her head, pats my hand. You did a nice thing for your old Mime Cora Rose. God sees. She puts her hands on her knees, stands up slowly, picks hairpins off the table and walks to the window, pinning up her hair. She nods towards Stella, who's shooting spooks against the barn. Go, she says. Stella and I walk to Mime's barn. I push up the latch and the doors swing open. Stella boards the door bolts the doors shut from inside. There are only two cows. They stare at us, tilting their heads like something funny is going on. It's not feeding time and it's not milking time. Light streams in from two triangular windows on each side of the high roof and between the missing boards of the dilapidated side walls. The cow Pepe named Bill Woos. He named the cow Bill because he said there were too goddamn many girls in this family. Stella climbs over the stall and straddles Bill's back, which is as big as our coffee table. She spits on the floor, pulls onto Bill's neck with one hand, and waves her other hand in the air like she's riding a bucking bronco. Stella's skinny and strong. Right him, cowboy, she says, grins, waves her arms, scabbed up from mosquito bites. I grin back at her and scratch the other cow behind it, her ears. My cow's name is Molly. Pretty cow, I kiss Molly between her big crossed eyes. Get on Molly's back, Stella says, bossy. I shake my head. I can't screw up before I get communion tomorrow. Sometimes Stella lays her head on Bill's neck and talks in her dreamy voice. It doesn't matter what she talks about. Something happens to me when she talks and watches me with her dark eyes. I get this feeling. If I sit on the cow, rock, and lay my head on Molly's head while Stella talks, the feeling goes up my legs, making me abundantly happy and nervous. I can't look at Stella. I pretend I don't know she's giving me a look, waiting for me to jump on the cow's back. My face gets hot. I pet Molly. 
Bill and Molly are side by side in the same oversized stall. Stella swings her legs. She'll let it swoosh back and forth against mine if I get on Molly. My Pipper used to let me ride Molly around the pasture, I say. I remember with the bay. He swore a lot. Get on Molly's back, she says. I shake my head again. Thou shalt not ride a cow, Stella says, disgusted. Lays her head on Bill's neck. Her long black hair hangs down from the cow like a mane. She scratches Bill's head and studies me. Do you confess your impure thoughts, Stella? I ask. I'm worried for her. She's Catholic, but hardly ever goes to confession, and she says whatever pops in her head. Just to you, she sits on Bill and tries to wave the flies away from the cow's ears with a fistful of her own hair. That night, I lie in bed with my head on my hands, looking up at the ceiling. My sisters are in their own beds, on either side of me. Marie leaps through Cosmo. Renee sits on the edge of her bed, head bent forward, sitting setting her hair in huge pink rollers. Know the stuff Mime says about getting so many foolish words before you die? Where'd she come up with that? I ask. Marie flips on her stomach and throws the magazine on the floor. Mime's tired of people talking shit, she says, so she says we'll die sooner if we don't shut the fuck up. Huh. Renee fluffs her pillow, lays down her big rollered head, and flips off the light switch. That's a smart observation, Marie. I wait for Marie's answer, something snotty about Renee using the word observation. But there's only breathing on either side of me. Nice. The 11th commandment should be, there shall be 10 minutes before the lights go out when everyone must be nice. I hear Marie turn and face the wall. I say three Hail Marys for Pepe. I can't stop thinking about how sad Mimi will be when she dies and goes to heaven if Pepe is not there waiting for her. My legs move, move back and forth over my clean sheets. The sheets are cool on my legs. Fresh seat, sheets remind me of sitting in church with the cool, smooth wood of the pew on the back of my thighs. I wish I was still six years old, sitting next to Mime's big body, safe in the whoosh of all the people as they stand and kneel, the hem of Mime's skirt passing over me like a warm washcloth every time she stands up or sits down. The altar boy in his white skirt, swinging incense from a ball on a long chain. My head in the crook of Mime's arms, breathing lily of the valley until the altar boy and the incense disappears into the vestibule. I snuggle my blanket up to my face. Marie is curled up in a ball, breathing loud. Renee's on the other side, a lump in the dark, too. I slide on my side, put my fist between my legs, close my eyes, and rub my face in the clean pillowcase. Stella's black hair hanging down, a piece of straw poking out of it, Molly's soft cow neck, my, hip, my hips rock, just to help me fall asleep, not enough to disturb my sisters or to ruin my confession. The end. <laughs> I felt like I was there. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> God, I'm glad I'm no longer a teenager. Isn't it? Is it? Me too. Long time gone. Uh, I just don't ever want to do that again. It, when I when I was, as I've grown up, you know, I've heard people say, "Oh, I wish I could go back to the good old days," and I was like, "I don't ever want to be in high school ever, ever, ever again." In childhood. <laughs> No, I'm not into it either. I, you know, if I if I was to go back to any point in time, maybe in my early twenties, but no, thank you. Yeah, twenties, maybe thirties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've quieted down some, but yeah, no, I don't want to be a teenager again. And 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 I I think when I went to Catholic school, I got out of actually doing confession because I wasn't Catholic. Um, oh. oh. Yeah, they, they gave the option, but that said that there were um, regular times when we had to go to church before school, like we'd have a, a truncated schedule, but we'd have to go early to church and then go to classes. Even though you weren't Catholic? Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> I well, feel sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the funny thing is, um, at my school there was a lot of different faiths, you know, and I think... 
some of which I think they sent their girls to Catholic school because it was the nicest, most conservative place they could send their kids. Right. And and it was often a good education, not always, but often. It wasn't too shabby. I liked my college better, but... um, So how did you get the idea for this novel? Um, Well, the novel is about three sisters um, growing up very lower working class in a small town. And one of them gets married, gets pregnant, gets married very young um, and has a has a kid and has a dread disease. So, you know, those are um, broadly facts of my life. It's definitely fiction, you know particularly when I'm writing about the individuals, but it really was drawn, you know, as a first novel drawn from the broad facts of my life, Mm -hmm. as many first novels are. And then, and you know, there's a custody battle, the whole thing. So I I drew from my own life. Uh, Do you write short fiction as well? Yes. Yes. I've I've written a lot of short fiction. I also write poetry, Ah. but more, more short fiction. And I'm working on a second novel too which is definitely not about my own life, except that it's about old lesbians and I'm only getting older. So, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So short fiction, uh, what genre do you write? Um, I guess I write literary fiction. I don't know. Sometimes I write humor. Um, I have a book of short stories that I'm about to, um, and on this, and I write erotica, so I would say there's, I don't know, maybe 12 stories in the, in the collection I have, and I think probably five or six of them are erotica. Nice. So I, I want to thank you for sharing those evil little teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part was trying to hedge your bets when what you're going to say to the priest and what he kind of snags on right. to. Right. <laughs> Like, my favorite confessional scene in any movie was in Moonstruck. And um, she, he's like, hold on, Loretta. What was that last sin? Yeah, <laughs> I, slept right. with the, I slept with the brother of my fiancé. That's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> pretty big. And uh, the, the conceit that, that um, the priest doesn't know who you are always, even as a very young girl, was always like, this is... They know who you are. Yes, they do. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you so much for coming on Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.